各位朋友，大家好，欢迎到不寻常对话。大家一定会非常好奇，不寻常对话会怎么会有一个不寻常的我？因为今天龙老师正在法兰克福书展的这个 book tour 的路上，那所以他就请我来呃来做经营这呃进行这场不寻常的对话。我是天下杂志的总编辑陈一山哦，那也是长期以来跟龙应台基金会非常长期合作的一个伙伴，那一直觉得蛮荣幸的有这个机会。那为什么呃？即使老师人在海外哦，他还是非常想要做这场不寻常的对话呢。是因为呃，有一位他的好朋友认识了非常长的一段时间，他正好这一次到台湾来做一个呃呃采访的行程哦，那就是《南德日报》的驻北欧特派员 K 马凯马凯先生。K， 你的你的呃那个信实在太难发了，要不然您自自己发一下你的全名应该怎么发？ <laughs> okay, uh, what a German means. What a sing is Strittmatter, Kai Strittmatter. Okay, so you guys. But there are also German names, Ma Kai. Ma Kai. Okay, so I, uh, this time, why do I want Ma Kai to come? Because I think, uh, Ma Kai should be the first one I've met from the foreign press. Uh, contact with China the earliest, the earliest. This is a very special experience. Uh, Ma Kai in 1986, 87, went to China to study Chinese to study Chinese. 那他后来跟我说，在西安学中文的时候，其实都去玩，没有什么学到。所以呢，他第一次来台湾也是在一九八七年、八八年。那他来做的事情呢，是到台湾的补习班去学中文，是吧？没有错。是的。而且你觉得台湾教的还不错，非常好。<笑>所以<笑>所有的中文都是在这里学的。<笑> OK， 所以大家如果待会呢听到他的中文呢。呃，我们待会的对对谈方式呢，会是我说中文，因为要对谈嘛，所以我们会各自选择各自比较舒适的语言。那马凯因为很多的专有名词可能一开始都是用英文来学习的，所以他就会用英文。但是我们两个都可以彼此听得懂彼此的，所以这个对话是没有问题的。那学完中文之后呢，马凯在呃《南德日报》工作，他的中国的经历是一九九七年，他的第一个外派的工作是到呃采访香港回归哦。呃，的回归中国，我想这是一个非常华丽的开始哦。所以从一九九七年到二零零五年呢，他就是住在中国。我想大家如果知道中国历史，这是一个非常特殊的年代哦，因为在那段时间，中国是非常的希望融入世界，所以最标志性的事件应该就是二零零一年的时候加入了 WTO。那在二零零六年到二零一二年，他有一个很特别的经历，他到了土耳其。那土耳其如果对国际关系有点了解的，呃。朋友应该也会知道，土耳其在过去的一段时间，其实在民主跟独裁之间有严重的，有一个非常严重的倾斜跟摆荡。那二零一二年到二零一八年呢，他又回到了中国。那这本书呢，是在呃这段时间他呃写成的。那他是在这本书呢，在。英文的名字叫做《独裁的重新发明》。那英德文的名字，德文的名字是 Harmon, Harmonious Society。所以台湾的翻译“和谐社会”是用用英英文的名字，但是在德文的名字就是呃“独裁的重新发明》（Re Inventing of Dictatorship）。Yes. 对，所以呃，我想他是一个是一个非常有资格来谈论中国。那其实上次呃，凯呃马凯下飞机的第一天。应该是第一个下午没几个小时，我们就在这碰面。那在过去两周，他去了非常非常多的地方哦。你要不要先聊聊这两个礼拜的感想？<笑>哎呀 ，I saw so much in the past two weeks, met so many people,、uh, and my head is spinning actually.、Uh, And I'm very grateful, actually, to be back in Taiwan because,、uh, you know, when I came here for the first time, it was I actually was here the month that Jiang Jingguo died. Wow, it's a really long time ago. That was a long time ago,、mm. and so I basically, you know, the the end of dictatorship and the beginning of the transformation to democracy, and it's just great, really exciting to be here and see how. What a kind of thriving democracy it is, and also the, the diversity of people that you can can speak to. It's just such a big difference to China, to the mainland.、And、I fear, you know, and especially because of this book, that I probably will never be able to go back to China, and I don't even dare to go to Hong Kong. So basically. When I want to meet people speaking Chinese and still have some Chinese food, I have to come to Taipei. No, I I, I want to come to Taipei.、Yeah. <laughs> But you basically right now in Denmark, right?、Uh, actually, a couple of months ago, I moved to Munich finally. To Munich. So it's my first time in 25 years 
that I am back in my home. Okay. Yeah, 我想说，呃，龙老师为什么这次呢？呃，会特别想要介绍这本《和谐社会》啊？呃，大家可能会认为说，它其实是一本讲中国怎么样利用大数据操作，呃，这个数位监控的一本书。但是我自己很感动，其实是在结论的部分。我来利用马凯的文字来跟大家讲一下。他说呢，体制之争又回来了，中国可以超越呃西方，跟自由民主社会登上世界的顶尖吗？如果独裁可以重新发明，那么在柏林、雅典、布拉格、伦敦跟华府等地，最迫切的任务就是重新发明西方的价值、欧洲的理念跟民主的精神。而台湾正好处于最前锋。最后关键并不在中国有多强大，关键在我们自己有多伟大，或们我们有多软弱，容易如何被分化，陷入了宿命论跟绝望。我们手上还是有好牌，不能让别人拿走。我们必须害怕的只有我们自己。我自己非常非常喜欢这个结论了，尤其是现在，因为台湾也快要选举了，所以其实以美论或者以中论，其实到处都是哦。那其实面对真实的情况，不指望别人呢，为自己想要或珍惜的价值来做努力。我觉得是这一场这本书，其实对我来讲，在结论部分，我自己非常喜欢的。我想也是为什么龙老师虽然人不在。台湾，但是还是很希望马凯可以跟线上的朋友一起来分享哦。所以我第一个想问的问题就是说，你在书里面提到说，中国其实不是呃西方社会哦，其实它就是不过就是人性和西方社会的一面镜子。就是说，其实西方社会在看到中中国，其实很多时候其实会跟自己看到。有一点关系，就会看到一点似曾相似的影子，感觉上是这个样子的感觉哦。那我很想问你的是说，因为你刚才我刚才介绍你的背景，那你其实是大概呃经历了江泽民，甚至经历过邓小平。你去念书的时候还是邓小平，经历过邓小平、江泽民、胡锦涛到习近平。那你的第一本书其实是叫做《China A to Z》。事实上是有点像字典的一本书，嗯，那想要帮助德国人可以了解中国，那在这一本书呢，其实你的起心动念也是想要帮欧洲人了解一个新的中国。我就想，然后但是最讽刺的是，你是在这本书出版的前一周，你离开了中国，所以你可不可以先谈谈你的中国四十年 ？Yes, um, I think also the reason why I wrote this book is、um, to make it clear for people that the China that exists now, Xi Jinping's China, is a completely different political being from the China that we used to. You know,、mm -hmm. many people still have a China in their head. This is the China we grow, grew up with. This is the China we spent all of our lives with. That's the China of Deng Xiaoping's Gaige、uh, Kaifang,、uh, reform、mm -hmm. and opening. And this is the China, you know. Back then, like me, young people were going there because、uh, it was opening up. China was curious towards us. We were curious towards China. It was so exciting, and it seemed to be changing for the better. Like you know, every week, every month, every year. And there even was a fantasy among some people. You know, China would one day、mm -hmm. inevitably become like us. You know,、uh, in German, we have a saying. Uh, uh, people were saying, you know. There is change through trade, which is、mm. like you know, a win-win. You only have to make profits, and automatically China will become、uh, yeah. democratic. Obviously, very convenient for those business people and some politicians. But reality, obviously, uh, uh, was different even back then. But still, uh, uh, I mean,、uh, Deng Xiaoping. Many of the reforms he initiated were reaction on the. Uh, 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 the rule of Mao Zedong, right? Mao Zedong was really a tyrant, an autocrat who destroyed China, and he didn't mind destroying China. He loved chaos, and、uh, many things that、uh, Deng Xiaoping、uh, did was were things to actually undo the systemic failures、mm. that led to a man of、uh, like Mao Zedong, which was decentralization of power. Getting rid of ideology, you know. I mean,、mm -hmm. they still said that they were a communist country,、uh, uh, country and party, but nobody talked about ideology a lot. Suddenly, capitalist business practices were all around, which confused people, right? Especially the Westerners.、Um, and there was no cult of personality anymore.、Mm -hmm. And、um, 
Business was number one, suddenly. Politics were number two. This is what we liked. Huh? Mm -hmm. And this is also what led to uh, the thing Deng Xiaoping said, okay, if you open up the windows, some flies will come in and we have to tolerate these flies. So the flies, obviously, uh, that they tolerated were the things that we found great about mm -hmm. the new Chinese society. Artists who spoke their yeah, mind right. and intellectuals, journalists testing out limits, mm -hmm. all this stuff. So this is the China that was so exciting for us and that we profited from at the same time, especially us Germans, you know, mm -hmm. we are the number one business yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, partner of China and Europe. And we found it great. And this is the China that still is in the back of the minds of some people, people who didn't realize what Xi Jinping had been doing when he was coming. Mm -hmm. So China had, was opening up, had needs for freedom, was uh, uh, a freer economy in some parts, also a freer society. There was never political freedom, but private freedoms. Yeah, mm -hmm. like people started to travel and whatever. Yeah. And people felt their lives were getting better day by day. And suddenly this guy, Xi Jinping, comes and he makes something, he does something that nobody expected back in 2012. Even the party people that I interviewed, you mm -hmm. know, people from the uh, uh, Academy of Science in Beijing and stuff, uh, party members themselves. Yeah. Nobody was expecting what Xi Jinping was about to do. He really brought back, I mean, this is something I just, I said in the beginning, China was always a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. even during those good years, but party control became less and less. Yes. But what it was not, mm -hmm. it was not a totalitarian country during those years. The last time China was a totalitarian system was actually under Mao Zedong. Mm -hmm. And suddenly under Xi Jinping, we started to see, wow, he is actually bringing totalitarianism back. Yeah. He's undoing many of the reforms that Deng Xiaoping made, and that are actually the basis, the foundation, the roots of this economic miracle that we've all vi visited. So suddenly Xi Jinping comes and over the course of these uh, now 11 years, step by step, he unmantles, the, he dismantles the old freedoms, these niches. He, he, he gets rid of all civil society uh, uh, organizations and actions, everything that is outside the control of the Communist Party, he doesn't tolerate anymore. Suddenly, it's, he's a control freak. The party has to control everything. He's also a freak for, you know, stability. He's very different from yeah. Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong didn't care about stability as long as it suited his power. Xi Jinping is very different. So stability, control above everything. Recentralization of power, ideology is back suddenly again. And not only Marxism, Leninism, suddenly mm -hmm. has his own brand of Marxism. Yeah? Xi Jinping Xiang. You know, suddenly he writes books. Actually, this year, you know how many books, books he has al already written or published under his name this year? I counted 16 or 17. Wow. All together since Very he, productive. Very productive. He's like the most, he must be the most prolific writer uh, on the planet at the moment. Since he took power, uh, it's more than 130, 140 big, uh, books supposedly being authored by Xi Jinping with his ideology. His ideology became part of the communist constitution. It became part of the People's Republic constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, again, so he brings back ideology. He brings back one man rule for the first time since Mao. He brings back centralization of power. He brings back the cult of personality or mm. the people around him bring it back. And I feel, and I have to say this also to um, Taiwanese listeners that actually, and this is something if you ask me about my last two yes. weeks, that yeah. surprised me a lot. Speaking to people, you know, different political opinions. Some people for KMT, some people uh, are Min Jindang people, some people vote for Ke. Uh, so they have different political opinions. But when you talk about the mainland, that you also in Taiwan, only 150 kilometers away from this country, and China being so important for the future, uh, of Taiwan, you find people that have no clue about what's going on on Taiwan. And people like saying, you know, speaking to taxi drivers or uh, uh, that tell me, oh, Xi Jinping, yeah, we don't really want him to come over. But actually, you know, uh, he does good things over there, right? I mean, I would talk. And, and, and uh, so uh, that really shocked me a little bit, actually, the lack of knowledge among some people 
about what kind of a China that is over there. And I can just advise mm. to all Taiwanese, look closely. This is a very different political beast than from the Deng Xiaoping years.我们在进行对谈的这一天就是因为你在中国其实进去到现在已经有四十年了。I think for me, I can speak for me and many of my colleagues that no, I was never uh, cheated actually. I was always very clear about the politics of this because they didn't hide it, you know, it's not mm. that they were hiding it. Mm -hmm. But there was a big tendency about Western businessmen, among Western businessmen and Western or politicians. politicians, they wanted to be cheated. Hmm. They wanted to cover their eyes because it, it's just much more convenient for them, you know, to continue to do business. You know, for, for example, uh, I just said it's been a dictatorship and I always wrote this about, but you know, among Western politicians and business people actually for many years, this word dictatorship became out of fashion. They were looking for another word because, you know, oh, it looks a little... It, it, it sounds a little, you know, yucky. Mm. It's like, oh, dictatorship. And we're doing business with with them, so mm. we don't want to do a business with a dictatorship. So they were looking for other words. So I think for a long time they were starting using things like, oh, authoritarian uh -huh. government, okay. something like this. Sounds a little better, right? Uh, it doesn't sound as bad as dictatorship. They were ba basically, um, let's say, cheating themselves or... Um, they were either blind and naive, or many people pretended to be blind or naive. I actually mm. tend to the, the latter, one. Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, because it just suited their profits and their political interests. surprised. 但是你真的起心动念想要这写这本书其实是因为川普的关系那是在要不要说说这个转折? Yeah. It was really double motivation. Of course, I wanted mm. to explain China, um, the new China, the yeah. China that I was seeing, these changes that I just described to you, because mm. I was seeing, you know, people in Europe didn't open their eyes to that. I thought, God, these people are still sleeping. And at the same time, we had these political uh, changes in our own societies, mm -hmm. you know. We had right-wing populists coming up, threatening our democracy. So in America, you had Trump coming up and actually, I mean, it is honestly the day, the night when I really decided I had to write this book was November 2016 was the night when Donald Trump got elected. And why? Because again, you know, I saw all my friends and all my colleagues in Germany, especially in Munich, you know, it's such Munich is mm -hmm. the economically mm -hmm. richest part of Germany yes. and everybody is so shufu there, you know, mm. and they're all wealthy and they don't, and, and they have forgotten a little bit how precious democracy is, you know, what a fragile thing it may be. And then I saw them looking at Trump and speaking about Trump and not getting it. They didn't understand what was happening, you know, the fake news, alternative facts, you know, now we, we, we speak about this all the time. But if you remember 2016, yes. this was something new back then. Right, right. Everybody was like, oh, what's that? Why is he lying? What, mm. what? What does he do? Why is he lying so shamelessly, you know? He speaks about his inauguration and he says, the biggest crowd of all times. While everybody was seeing it in front of their eyes, you know, and you could compare it with one click in the internet to the pictures of Obama's uh, inauguration. And you saw that, you know, with Trump's, it was raining. There were not a lot of people there. 
So why does he do that? And I heard people and I saw it written in headlines and in articles about Trump. Trump is a pathological liar. And I was like, that. no, no, you don't understand what's happening. He's not lying pathologically. It's mm -hmm. not a, an illness, a sickness. He's lying strategically and systematically. And this is not a new thing. Again, this is something that autocrats and would-be autocrats have done for hundreds and thousands of years. They use this as an instrument. This, these lies, the lies that Trump's, Trump is using and the lies that dictators in China are using. Because I, I, I was saying, I was like, oh, good, I've lived this literally for 20, 30 years of my life, mm. all these fake news, alternative facts, because I was living in China, because I was living in Turkey, also half democracy half authoritarian countries and they are not they don't want to convince you with these lies mm -hmm. those lies serve two purposes one purpose is they want your submission you have to submit to these lies and the second purpose is to confuse you they want to sow confusion because people like him you know these liars and cheats these would be autocrats you know if you are a liar and a cheat living in a world where people still care about truth, you can't win. Hmm. You have to make people believe that everybody is a liar. And when everybody is a liar and everything is a lie, then at least you are their liar. Hmm. And then the truth doesn't count anymore. Then only power counts. You know? wow. And Hannah Arendt, you know, the great uh, uh, German-American mm -hmm. who, who fled from mm -hmm. Nazi mm -hmm. Germany to America and wrote uh, this, this amazing book about, uh, about totalitarianism, mm -hmm. the origins of totalitarianism. She wrote about this and she gave interviews about this. And he said, you know, um, actually, when those people are lying, they don't want you to make they don't want you to make believe those lies. What they want is that nobody believes in anything anymore. Mm. And once people don't believe in anything anymore, then there's no way to reflect. Then there's no way to judge. There's no way to act in a democracy anymore. And then the powerful can do with you whatever they want. Wow. And this was where her experience was with Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And those were the people, uh, the experiences with Stalinist Russia. And this is what you can see in China. And back to our starting points, the same techniques, the same instruments being used uh, uh, by a right wing populace in our own midst. Mm. Uh,因为大家会觉得民主在,呃,因为台湾就是非常发了美国的民主制度,所以你会觉得那个地方,然后它又是一个民主的这个强权的代表,连那个地方都可以沦陷。所以我想你那个冲击应该是非常非常大的
你要不要讲讲这个对你的感觉 ？Yes, exactly. I mean, especially because when these things happened, I was a correspondent in China, so we actually really felt stabbed in the back, uh, uh, stabbed in the back by、mm-hmm. by the Obama,、yeah. you know, Obama, the good guy.、Uh, not only the Snowden revelations happened、uh, uh, under him, but also the the Guantan- Guantanamo Bay, right? The torture, suddenly、mm-hmm. a democracy torturing its its prisoners. How how can that be? So obviously, uh, uh, institutions like the Communist Party they love this, and they took it as look what the Americans are doing. Aren't they exactly the same like us? They always accuse us of doing this, but isn't in the end everybody exactly the same? And let me tell you, when I go out and speak about China in public lectures in Germany or in Switzerland or whatever or in England. <laughs> I sometimes get the same reaction. People, people, you know, there's a lot of anti-American sentiment all over the world, right? Also in Europe. So they say, "Oh, but the Americans are just the same. They're just as corrupt, and they're just..." And this is a very interesting point because, of course, this is nonsense.、Huh? Because if you look at it, of course, people are weak. Man is weak. You know,、mm-hmm. He's a weak animal, and he's prone to corruption.、Mm. And he's prone to sin, and he's prone to abuse of power, which and that's the same all, all over the world. You know, it's not like Chinese are more corrupt than Americans, or Americans are more corrupt、mm-hmm. uh, than Germans. It's the same all over the world for all people. So the point here being is, you need a good system to pit, put people in and to put men in to restrict、yeah. the bad, corrupting tendencies. And this is where democracy comes in, and this is where democracy、uh, has the big advantage. And of course, it's not the same. I mean, you know, we had Snowden in America; we were all shocked. But there is a reason why there never was a Snowden coming out of China. You know, because、mm. America, with all its faults, and even under Trump, was still a democracy. There were still courts working. There was still an independent judiciary. There was still the New York Times, the Washington Post, reporting uh, uh, and critically,、uh, and you still had an independent、um, Congress in the United States and all this thing. And this is what it's all about: democracy, checks and balances, balance. separation of power. Actually, I would say much more, or at least as important as election. This is actually the core of democracy:、mm-hmm. checks and balances, separation of power. This is, and of course, it's a constant struggle. And we will have new scandals out tomorrow, you know, in Germany, in America, in Taiwan about the government. But democracy is a constant struggle. The good thing about democracy is it gives us the instruments and the uh, uh, and the channels to actually better ourselves and better the system. So, democracy should not be expecting the people or every person to do the right thing, not to commit crimes. But the important thing is that you mentioned a very good word, which is the system. 就是说，其实是一个 check and balance 的制度，也就是说，民主因为在这样的环境下，它可以把很多不对的事情揭露出来。就是说 ，Snowden 其实可能在中国做了很多，或在集权国家做了很多，但不会被揭露出来，是因为没有那个制度把它发现出来。就是对。对。但是你会觉得，民主国家现在的这个制度，这种一直频繁的出现这样子，大家觉得可以。被集权国家拿来作为画饼的一些错误的事情，是因为现在的民呃民主制度遇到了一些挑战吗？还是说其实它都存在，只是从前没有被爆出来 ？Of course, there's huge challenges now, and I would say democracies, you know, for a couple of years now have been in crisis, right? Because it seemed like a perfect storm as it was actually approaching to towards democracies and. Uh, uh, the right-wing populists and people like Trump undermining our own democratic systems, being one part, and then if you talk about、uh, foreign influences,、uh, Russia and China being the other ones, and those combining, there is a lot of challenges, and there is some structural problems with democracy. I would say. The main one, if we talk about European democracy, being social inequality.、Mm-hmm. Which is a huge factor. Why people suddenly love to vote for right-wing people、yes. because they feel left behind, right?、Mm-hmm. So this is something we have to address. But I think this is something we can address. And to be honest, you know, if you, if you'd asked me maybe two three years ago, I would have been more pessimistic than now, because what we've seen 
in Europe, the big tragedy happening, Russia invading Ukraine, so obviously a big tragedy. Um, at the same time, suddenly it woke our European societies up somehow. Suddenly there was this awakening. There was this suddenly, wow, there is a threat. And all these people that had been sleeping before yeah. suddenly woke up. Mm -hmm. They started speaking about these topics. And, and that's the most important thing, and something some people thought impossible before, two years ago, uh, it, it had a uniting force, you know? Suddenly this, yeah. this, this European Union where, you know, it, it, before it looked a little bit like a, a hen's barn where every, you know, all the hens were running around in different directions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody was speaking with a, with a different voice. Suddenly we were speaking with one, one voice. Wow, incredible. I don't, I don't think I have ever seen that before in my life, actually. And uh, so this really gives me hope. Uh, but as I said, it's a constant struggle and... Um, but that's a good thing. In democracy, you know, everybody can stand up and everybody can take part in this struggle. Uh, on the flip side, you have to, mm -hmm. you know, don't, you know, uh, sit there just comfortably and think other people uh, will do the job for you. You 捍衛民主這件事情感覺上有非常大的這個drive想要做這件事情,所以這個現象是可以自己覺得最感動的事情是什麼?Well, of course as I said, it's it's always a struggle, you know, and yeah. we have one day we have good uh, good news like in Poland, you know. Poland had a sort of when we talk about the danger of democracies flipping. Yeah. Um, there are countries where the danger is more present than in mm -hmm. others, like Turkey, the country I was in, half democratic, half authoritarian. That's actually a good warning example. I saw it flip. When I was there, there was hope. 2005 to 2012, those were the good years. We all thought Turkey was going to make it, you know, under the same Mr. Erdogan, who is now president. He was prime minister back then. Mm -hmm. And then we saw it flip to another, uh, into authoritarian direction. And the lessons there, how quick that went. I mean, of course, the institutions in Turkey weren't as strong as they are in, in Germany, for example. But that was a very, very shocking, uh, actually, um, uh, lesson for many of us. And it should be a lesson for everyone, you know, that somehow when you live in a mature democracy like Germany, it's different from Taiwan because mm -hmm. you're a young democracy, you have lost the memory of there was a time when everything was very different. You have lost this memory. You, you don't, you know, Germany, we were a dictatorship, we were a Nazi dictatorship. And our grandparents actually were living in that. But you have lost this memory, how quick it, had, it can actually flip. So Turkey is one example. Poland, the country next, uh, our neighboring country, was another example going down the authoritarian road. Hungary is yeah. an example like this. And the good news, I was speaking about good news. So Poland had an election. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, you know, it, seem, it seems as the democratic side has taken actually back the power from the authoritarians. So there is good news in the struggle for democracy. In, and actually the Polish example is something that moved me most mm -hmm. in the last. And, and then at the same time, there's also bad news. Like at the moment in Germany, if you look at the opinion polls, uh, the AfD, uh, Alternative für Deutschland, which is our own right-wing populist movement, is actually climbing in the opinion polls. And it's nearly at 20% already. So you might say 20% is not a lot, but still, you know, it changes also the climate of public debate. For example, when they get more percentage point debate about migration, about foreigners tends to become much more hostile. Hmm. Um, and things like this. So, but in the end, still, I would say, you know, it's not those 20% I'm worried about. You know, those, I think this potential 20% of right-wing world you have in nearly every country in Europe uh, uh, at the moment. It's the other 80% that I'm worried about, that they don't get their asses up and, you know, speak. Those 80% who are the good Democrats, they consider themselves the good Democrats, the good Europeans. Yes, you can be, you can consider yourself that, but you know, you need to act.
act on that. You need to get up. Now is the time to, I would say, you know, I'm, how old am I now? Sorry, 58, I think. <laughs> um, I think this is the first time in my life in the past three, four or five years where I really have the feeling we have to get up and fight for democracy. And there's hope. I'm optimistic at the moment, but people have to join in. Yeah, but uh, 在你的书里面其实有一个, uh, 我想很特别的事情, 是谈到了, uh, 科技的监控, technology and surveillance. 我其实看你的这本书,另外有一个感觉是, 它其实不只是一个跟科技监控有关的书, 如果你看完整本书, 你会发现它是一个整个系统的一个部分, 里面其实提到了譬如说孔子, 然后其实提到了心里面的一些因素, 所以你会怎么描述，就是说为什么中国的这个反乌托邦的这一切的事情会发生呢？你自己觉得是怎么样来讲这个结构性的一个？It's actually the Chinese example of dictatorship is actually amazing. I think the world has never seen has never seen a political uh, regime like this. This is really something completely new, and um, because it it's based on a whole factor, um, you know, it em embeds people in a whole factor of uh, 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 factors that determine your life and your state of being. And as you said rightly, the new thing, the sexy thing in the press in the past years has been the digital, technology, yeah. digital technology. So you have a surveillance regime now based also on artificial intelligence and, and um, monitor. big data. Monitor everywhere. Monit monitor everywhere which it really is already as dystopian as you have never seen anything in the world before. It's really amazing. I mean, already 2018, the People's Daily came out with a tweet saying, already now, five mm -hmm. years ago, uh, our Skynet, which is the network of all these surveillance ca uh, cameras, is capable of identifying each and every single one of our 1.4 billion people in one second. Mm. And they wrote that in English on Twitter. You, you can Google it, you can still yes, find it. Right. Uh, they're very proud of that. And of course, when I read it, my reaction was like, oh God. So it sounds very scary, right? But back then, five years ago, I thought actually my first reaction then was, well, I don't even believe that, you know. Mm. I thought there's too many technological, you know, many of those uh, databases, many of those networks were actually like islands, you know, of provinces, cities. Are they really connected to each other? I didn't believe them back then. But then when you go another step, you realize that the most important thing is not whether this is true or not. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is whether you believe it to be true. Mm. And this is a central thing. Yeah, it's a thing. Yes, because internalization of control. You know, you don't need the policeman in the corner anymore if the policeman is sitting in your head. And this yeah. is what the new technological surveillance does with you. It internalizes control. Suddenly you have this all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful eye hovering above you. And of course, you don't know does this I does this watch? Mm -hmm. Is he watching you now at the moment? You don't know. You don't know, yeah. But that doesn't matter. Mm. You know that it could be watching you. That's mm -hmm. all you need to know. And you change your behavior. You start to self-censor, you start to become a guai, a very guai behaving <laughs> citizen, right? Mm -hmm. So internalization uh, of control is one thing. But the surveillance and like also, let's say, uh, uh, measurements like, you know, terror uh, uh, instruments, making people afraid by, by uh, um, detaining people, having show trials on TV. Uh, uh, these things are all there, they're in the background, but they're not enough. The Chinese government, it's much smarter, this, this new kind of uh, control among people, because it goes together with other factors. It goes together with lifelong brainwashing. Yes. And the brainwashing has become much more powerful under Xi Jinping. Nationalism. Mm -hmm. He's not, you know, I, I said before, he brought ideology back, but only as a means of submission. He doesn't really believe that people actually, you know, believe in these kind of, in Marxism anymore. 
not a lot of people in China believe in Marxism anymore. So that's not at a, the time. That's not a mm. pillar of legitimacy for the party. Mm -hmm. So he brought nationalism, and he's really strengthened this this kind of nationalist um, education starting in kindergarten. Mm. And at the same time, he's uh, and he's he's it's the big China dream, right? The China dream, the rejuvenation reju of the Chinese nation. So we will bring back. China to its, its old power and its old role in the world. China, again, will overtake the United States. It will be number one in the world. And nationalism works. We all know that, right? We know that from Russia. It works in every country. It's very cheap, especially for authoritarian. It's cheap and effective. And it works in China. It works very well. And surprisingly, and another surprise for me in my last time, it also works in Taiwan. Suddenly, I hear people speak, wow, Xi Jinping, great, you know. He makes people respect China again. Of course, it's old Kuomintang people who, who, who <laughs> think this mo mostly. I was still surprised to hear sentences like this mm -hmm. here in Taiwan. So this works. And then let's not forget the last factor and maybe one of the most important ones. The party delivered materially all this time, you know. It gave the people wealth and growth, economic growth. And people for 30, 40 years, every year could feel, at least the urban populace, the farmers not so much, but the people in the, in the cities, they could feel that they were better off year by year. And there was this promise, even if now you are not well off, you know, you look at all the other people being well off and you think, Maybe next year it's my turn. Okay. So there's hope mm. always there. And all this to the, together then makes a very, very smart and convincing system uh, to actually make, control people on the, other, uh, on the one hand, but also make them obedient citizens uh, uh, on the other. And, uh, and even cheering maybe for Xi Jinping and for a dictatorship. You know, there's a very, very, I'm, People very often, when they look at China, they think of George Orwell, George yes, Orwell, 1984, right. Mm -hmm. right? The surveillance state and the, the brainwashing and all this. And it's true. Half of it, half of China is like George Orwell, but it has outgrown Orwell a lot. It's not only because when you go to China, when you get off the plane, it's not an Orwellian sort of, you know, 1950 socialist, yes. whatever. It's colorful and vibrant and dynamic and loud and people go out eating and people uh, and people consume, you know, maybe it's the, 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 the there's whole orgies of, of, of commerce and, and, and co uh, consumption. Uh, it's a little bit the, this deal that the people has offered, uh, the party has offered to the people after 1989, you can get rich as long as you are quiet. So you can get rich and you can buy whatever you want and you can entertain yourself. And this is actually the other half. So George Orwell is the one half, but the other half is much uh, better described by another book from that time, which is Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. Uh, because Brave New World. Brave New World. Yeah, mm -hmm. Brave New World actually does not describe a socialist dystopia it actually describes a capitalist dystopia, which is one where people submit to this regime because they're fed non-stop entertainment yeah. and they consume all the time. Yeah? And China is a very clever mixture of the two. And mm -hmm. Aldous Huxley said one, one very famous sentence. He said, you know, it's very easy. Uh, it's not very easy, but it's easy to make slaves out of people. If you're a tyrant, if you're an autocrat, you can make your people into slaves. It's much harder and much smarter if you make those slaves love their slavery. If they love their slavery mm. and even think they're free. This is actually, you know, the, the high art of dictatorship. And in a way, for a long time, I think the Chinese Communist Party was very good at that. When you were talking about this process, you mentioned that there was a point in the process, which was before Xi Jinping, or before Xi Jinping's 
，其实呃，中国的确在国家的政治部分是没有任何是 dictatorship， 但是在下层人民的生活里面是有很多的呃，私人生活上面是有一些 freedom。但是你刚才又说它是有点奴隶式的，然后是因为消费主义所造成的，这两个东西你会觉得是一致的吗？还是说其实是不一样的事情 ？Well, it belongs together. You know, it's very one of the most fascinating studies I came about. Actually, was done by Stanford University, together with a professor in Beijing.、Mm -hmm. Uh, how the system changes uh, uh, people, and it was a study they did in Beijing University.、Uh, well, they don't name the university, but it, it, it's probably Beijing University. They made a survey in 2016, 2017 among 1,800 Beijing University students, and they asked they they provided them with a VPN, so、mm -hmm. with a with an app that they could then uh, uh, circumvent censorship,、yeah. uh, censorship. Yes, to get information from outside.、Mm -hmm. And they wrote six emails to those students, and. Reminding them again and again. Hey, by the way, we sent you this VPN, and good VPNs cost like back then also like 100 US dollars, very much for a, for yeah, a student.、Yeah. So they were paying for this,、yeah. you know. So there was an incentive, but the, the students didn't really seem to, you know. After the six emails, still、um, there、uh, there was only a very small percentage of those students actually using these VPNs. So.、Uh, um, They thought、um, they give them another incentive, and they told them, "Okay, we will have a quiz, you know, and you you can only answer the questions to this in 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 this quiz if you have actually read outside information,、mm. you know." And it's not a language problem, because there's a lot of Chinese language information out. Taiwanese yeah, websites,、yes. mm -hmm. the New York Times is every day in Chinese, Financial Times, so you can get. Uh, uh, this information. So they said to the students, and you can win an iPad. So suddenly, the subscriber rates shot up, and those people got out and uh,、um, uh, got this information. But the the amazing thing it was when they started doing this, and from the people, you know, I think it was five percent of the people who actually, or they had in the end half of the people who went outside、uh, the Great Firewall.、Mm -hmm. But do you know how many? Percent of those people、Left. actually, you know, actually was consulting news websites, you know, as、like、opposed to Japanese porn or、uh, South Korean boy bands, or、um, it was five percent. Wow, very few. Very few, and it was not because of fear. It was because there, there was just no interest. Yes, and there was pay da shuisheng. It was the future of the country. Leaders. The the future leaders of the country, the supposedly brightest, most curious people in the country, and、uh, by the way, Beida、uh, being the place where all democracy movements in China in the past 100 years emerged,、mm -hmm. and they were just not interested in outside information, or they didn't even know that there was outside information. That just shows, you know, that shows how effective this kind of system. Can be,、hmm. and then it it doesn't even matter if there are cracks in the system, because small cracks, some people going out, you know, some dissidents going there, surfing the New York Times. Who cares? You know, it doesn't matter as long as it's not many people. So it's really a very very effective system. Well, it's been so far. Maybe this is going to change because we have what we have seen in the past months and in the past two years. I would actually say that <laughs> Xi Jinping. By making himself a new all-powerful leader and shutting off all kind of criticism, is actually making himself vulnerable again and making the system vulnerable again because he does what all dictators do: he makes himself blind. Wow. Okay. But you mean, 就像你说的，事实上，可能生活在里面的人也没有那么的在意，尤其是年轻一辈的人。所以，可是我自己一直很想问一个问题，就是说，其实中国从呃改革开放开始，其实是非常漫长一段时间，几乎就是四十年哦。那当然中间有因为天安门事件有停闲下来过、嗯，但是这么四十年，其实养出了非常多的所谓的中产阶级，就是西方相信的说
，因为呃富起来，那他们也可以出国去，那甚至在海外求学，开始应该会有一些不同的想法。但是为什么在这一段时间，大家是因为恐惧不发生，还是说他们真的就已经习惯了那个这个顺服了这个体制呢？ I think it's a mixture of everything. You're right. I mean, many、mm. people actually they did develop a critical, critical thinking. thinking. There are many people on the mainland that are critical, and some of them even courageous and came out.、Mm-hmm. And I would say the height of this was in 2012. That was shortly before Xi Jinping got to power, because that was. Year number four of Weibo, you know、yeah. this social media that was established in 2009, and actually those four years were probably the most exciting, exciting. years、yes. in the People's Republic history.、Uh, history, <laughs> because the the most amazing thing happened. The party sort of didn't seem to know for those four years how what to do with Weibo, and suddenly there was freedom of information and freedom of discussion on Weibo, like you have never. Ever seen in China, and the most amazing outcome of this was that you saw that a lot of people actually really were uh, uh, suddenly uh, discussing these liberal, liberal Western thoughts, and th- that these ideas had a lot of attraction、uh, uh, for people. And they were also discussing corruption, <laughs> corruption of the Communist Party, and all this, which made the party really afraid. And Xi Jinping, unfortunately, we have to say, he showed that after he、uh, became、yes. the leader, leader, it only took him two months, and Weibo was dead as a as a forum of political discussion. But it showed how attractive these kind of ideas were、uh, for the Chinese people, which also explains this famous document that came out in 2013 under Xi Jinping's rule, which is ba- basically a declaration of war against. Western values、mm. and against Western democracy. This is the famous doc- document number nine, and it lists all those things that can never happen in China:、mm-hmm. separation of power, power, civil or civil society, all those things we、uh, we talked about it. And this actually, it was a declaration of war against Western value, against Western democracy, and it was the starting point of the ideological cleansing campaign of Xi Jinping that lasts. Until today, and when you ask about people, they are afraid now. Of course, many people, I would say, in my generation, actually, strangely enough, or, or not strangely enough, they are probably the most critical ones. Yeah. And why would I say that? Because they are the ones who have personally experienced the crimes of the Communist Party. They were children when the Cultural Revolution happened. They saw、mm-hmm. what happened to their parents, how they had go had to go to labor camp. They were sent. Uh, to the countryside as as young students, and they have witnessed Tiananmen Square. And the sad, sad, sad thing is, the、They're、younger the people go,、yes. the more the nationalist brainwashing works,、mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the least critical people tend to be the younger generations. And that's really a sad thing. But then again, silver lining. Probably, you know, in the end. What will be the biggest challenge for Xi Jinping and his Communist Party is not some, you know, theoretical discussions about democracy and what that comes later. It will be economic difficulties, and this is where young people are at the forefront. And this is why we have seen in the Beijing Ring Dong how suddenly young people stepped to the forefront, not because they were dissatisfied on a theoretical level with not having democracy, but because they saw in their daily lives they could. Their parents could not make a living anymore, because China calls itself communist, but it, it's no welfare state.、Mm-hmm. So this harsh lockdown deprived people of their livelihoods. Actually, people were hungry, some of them, you know. And the others were the students、uh, who suddenly realized, wow, they are the first generation in 40 years who don't have a promising outlook after graduating. Youth. Unemployment is at an all-time high. The official figures are 20 percent, but that's the official Chinese figures,、mm. and those are a record already. Probably there's a, 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 it's a much higher number, and those are the people who went、uh, to the streets. And if you ask me for any prediction, you know, when will there be a challenge to the rule of Xi Jinping? It will be when those economic difficulties become. 对，其实，在书里面你有讲到，就是共产党跟中国人的社会契约
，事实上有两件事情。第一件事情就是富有，就是说变有钱，然后大家生活过得好。第二件事情就是民族主义嘛。其实这两件事情，我觉得当没有富有这件事情，就只剩下民族主义。很多人认为说，其实这对台湾是比较危险的一个状态。Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly the point. So when people ask me about this, and then I tell them, you know, okay,、um, the good news is China will probably not overtake the United States、um, because Xi Jinping is shooting himself in his foot constantly. We've seen it、uh, in the end of the Corona management. We've seen it with other things. He suddenly does not take. He does not put economy. At number one, he puts politics at number、mm-hmm. one. He puts political control at number one, which means this will automatically hurt economic growth in China. So good for us in the West, we can say, you know, good news. Bad news for Taiwan probably,、mm. because、um, this will eventually lead to more and more dissatisfaction because there's a lot of internal conflict underneath. You know this、uh, layer of harmony, you know,、mm-hmm. and uh, Wei Wen, uh, uh, that they uh, that the Communist Party propagates. There's so much contradiction、mm. in society. You know, it's one of the most corrupt societies in Asia. It's one of the most unequal societies in the whole world.、Mm-hmm. You know, calls itself communist. Uh, the Gini coefficient, which measures、uh, the, the difference between the most wealthy and the most poor parts of society in China, higher than in the United States of America, and all those contradictions. As long as you have money, you know, to throw at people, you can plaster over it, and you can.、Uh, uh, when the resources go away, and when the money goes away, and this becomes more difficult, then the challenges will grow, and then I fear he will seek. A point of deflection, and he will seek to distract attention,、hmm. and that might not bode well for Taiwan. This might be a point. You know, I'm not predicting a direct attack or、yes. something,、mm-hmm. but start some crisis. You know, and start some low-level crisis. And but once you are at that point, you never know. Yeah, shit happens. So、mm. even. Even if he might not want a war, you know things might get out of control. So this is what I'm worried about. You, but you 刚才提到一个点，我也觉得挺有意思，就提到年轻人哦。事实上，我觉得年轻人对未来没有希望这件事情，其实不是只有中国，我觉得全世界哦都一样哦。就台湾也是嘛，很多人都在讲这件事情。德国我猜应该也有这个问题。Actually, no. Actually, no?、Okay. the amazing thing is, and I think that has to do with demographics. Yeah,、mm-hmm. economy economy is not doing really well at the moment because of because of Corona. That's、mm-hmm. one reason. In Germany, also because we are Europe's, we are actually the last one on the list now with economic growth.、Mm-hmm. All the other European countries、yeah. have higher economic growth、right. than Germany because of the energy crisis. So people call Germany the sick man of of Europe, which. Is nonsense again because one of the reasons for that is we are number one. We are completely dependent on exports,、mm. and、uh, actually here, this is because of China. China's yeah, weakness、right. at the moment. This is why our exports、uh, are hurting. But we still have a quite、uh, healthy、uh, economy actually. And the amazing thing is, if I look at my my sons, I have a 17 year old and a 15 year old son and a 12 year old daughter. Uh, despite be- economic growth being so slow, there's a huge shortage of skilled workers and、mm-hmm. also university graduates in Germany because of demographics. Okay. okay. Because more people are dying and、uh, going into re- retirement. So actually, I would say、um, times has have in Germany、uh, never been as good for young people. <laughs> Mm. As as at the moment, they don't need to fear it. It's very very different from when I was graduating. We have. In Taiwan, we also think there is a shortage of skilled workers. But you ask young people if they feel they have a hope, they don't have such a thought. Shortage and hope. Why? 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 薪水不够啦，然后买不起房啦、啊嗯，我就说，哎，那你们不用买房啊，未来你们的父母都会给你们房。他说，那我成家立业，父母还没走啊，还是还是需要买房。那他们有没有想离开台湾呢？有没有这个现象？有，有很多人离开台湾，的确是有这个现象。嗯、比以前多吗？因为台离开台湾的那个一直都有，是不是最近几十年？呃，我觉得很多人高中毕业以后到
国外去念大学， okay. 就会留在国外。那你觉得他们现在离开台湾主要原因是那个经济上的，不是那个中国对台湾的威胁？我觉得是经济上的，我、okay. 比较不是因为中国的威胁，因为中国威胁大家开始感觉到战争威胁，应该是这两年的事情。嗯，嗯对，所以。蛮有意思的，我就是说这个 social contract， 中国的 social contract 未来要怎么样发展，社会契约未来会怎么发展？ Yeah, yeah, yeah. 我觉得跟台湾的未来。那请问去大陆的，就是以前不是有很多年轻人去大陆，有没有觉得那边的薪水薪水还比这里的高？去那边很多人都是去呃做互联网工作 ，internet。Company, OK OK OK， 现在 Internet company 都被灭了。但是那边的经济越来越差，会不会也影响这儿的？现在很多人往东南亚去了。OK， 从中国往东南亚去，我现在看到的趋势是这个样子。嗯、好，我来问一下，就是刚才我们回到那个呃，您刚才提到一本一个很重要的事情，就是民主，其实基本上。在中国大陆，他正在呃重新改造他的独裁，所以现在变成一个集权制度。那你一直在呼吁说，民主国家也要改造我们自己的这个呃系统啊。我其实自己对德国印象非常非常深刻是，是呃我之前去采访哦，自己最讶异的事情是，因为德国有纳粹的这个阴影之后，事实上花了很多的力气，而且也有点社会共识。其实国家愿意资助各个政党，那政党也愿意花钱。然后成立自己的 think tank， 所以每个自己的主要政党都有 think tank， 而且这 think tank 他们的工作呢，事实上除了呃帮政党做研究之外，有很大的一块是去学校跟学生讲说，哎，这个呃我们在这个议题上面，我们对这个政策上我们的看法是什么？那原因是背后是希望大家都有一个平等的权利，可以听到不同的意见，然后他觉得这是一个民呃抵挡上纳粹那个时候的一言堂的一个最好的。Yes, and they're not only, you know, speaking about their own party, but they do a lot of sort of democracy education. education. It's actually, it's actually a great thing. I mean, especially if I look Taiwan, where everything, countries like Taiwan, where everything seems to be so um, so uh, divisive when you speak about parties and party party、mm -hmm. politics. Actually, even those party think tanks, they actually they have a common mission. Which is educating people about democracy. So it's not as partisan as you as you might think. They're、mm -hmm. not handing out propaganda for their own for their own parties. They actually they have a very beneficial、uh, role there, and not only domestically, but they also go abroad. They have in all big countries, and like they also did some work in, in Taiwan,、yeah. uh, in Taiwan, and also in、uh, on the mainland. In,、mm -hmm. And they were you know, and they are the sort of. Uh, uh, Share、uh, division of labor there on the mainland was, for example, the Social Democrats because they were close to the labor movement. They would then in China try to work together with labor unions, and maybe try to you know establish、uh, a, a new thinking there. What is actually an independent、mm -hmm. labor union? Because obviously that doesn't exist in China. So I'm actually very curious because in in Germany, such a emphasis on hearing different voices and hearing different perspectives in a country. 对网络现在这种 social media， 因为它的演算法的关系，大家越来越抱团取暖。Yes， 你只会听得到自己相反。Yes， 你们怎么面对这件事 ？Yeah， this is a big problem. I think this is a global problem. It's a problem all over the world, and it is a danger to democracy. I would say, and twofold. One is obviously foreign influence. Like you with China, we have foreign influence from Russia mainly, but also Chinese. We also have Chinese propaganda in European social media, and the second then is like hate speech and polarization, like internally, like in our own society, a very very big problem. We're all thinking how to deal with that. There's obviously different approaches, so I think. In Germany, one still of the good things is one thing where we can balance that at the moment is that we have very, very strong still traditional media, like old newspapers, TV stations. We have a very strong public TV station system and public radio stations. And public TV, public radio does not mean government TV, government radio.、Mm -hmm. They criticize the government a lot. It really means public radio. So there are social. Social、uh, movements,、uh, social institutions, actually uh, um, sent into the into the leadership of these, and they still are sort of balance、mm -hmm. to, for example, when it comes to disinformation, fake news, and the second approach then 
what we actually came up with now in Europe, because we see, you know, I mean, we're dealing, we're not dealing with German internet companies. We're not de dealing with yes, French right. social media companies. We're dealing yeah, American companies. with American companies mainly and with Chinese, suddenly TikTok. The most popular one is TikTok, TikTok. by now also. So we're dealing with international companies and we need an international approach. And again, there, I think the European Union actually has been on the vanguard in, yes. in this. We're the first political entity worldwide to actually um, have regulations on that. And they only came, came into place recently, I think a couple of months ago, uh, the Digital Service, Service Act. Act. It's what, what it's called in, uh, in, the, in the European mm -hmm. Union. And it actually deals directly with these challenges. I mean, we still don't know how effective it will be, but it's being tested now. And it has teeth, I have to say, because, you know, so it, tests, it, it, it tackles different things. It also tackles problems with online shopping or, you know, commercial enterprising, targeting your children. Uh, uh, the big uh, internet companies are no longer allowed to actually have cookies targeting children, their shopping. Uh, these kind of things, but they also tackle directly election interference, mm -hmm. disinformation, fake news, these things. And very recently, last week, um, uh, the European Commission actually sent out the first letters to Facebook, TikTok, X, which used to be Twitter. And well, I don't remember well, <laughs> some of them, the biggest ones, mm -hmm. and actually requesting from them to take immediate action against fake news, disinformation circulating on all of their pl platforms regarding the Israel-Palestine conflict. Ah, okay. And when I say it has teeth, it really means these companies have to act because there are fines. If the companies don't act after a, a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. they can actually be fined up to 6% of their global revenue. Oh. which is a huge amount mm -hmm, of money. Mm -hmm. And if they still don't act, in the end, they could even, you know, at some point be banned. Obviously, we don't take that lightly. And obviously, there has been debate being, you know, between freedom of speech. Does it, you know, restrict mm -hmm. freedom of speech? And where's, where's the balance? But I think it's a good thing because if, you know, of course, restriction of freedom of speech can threaten democracy. But actually, this kind of disinformation which is really destabilizing for a democracy. And as I said, in Europe, problem number one is Russia. This can destroy a democracy uh, uh, in the end as well. And we've seen the examples, and I think the wake up call was the Trump election 2016 in America, which was heavily influenced by Russian disinformation and the Brexit mm -hmm. in England it was the same. So for Europe, that was a wake up call. And, mm -hmm. But you, you've told me and when we were speaking before that in Taiwan, actually, there's no legislation like this, right? 对, 其实台湾现在, 我真的也觉得台湾的数位的法规是有点点非常非常落后。其实我觉得有很多数位的法规在台湾的法规的环境里面是缺乏的。包含你刚才提到的社会数位服务法。其实台湾曾经想要立过相关的法规。判断就变成说放在里面但同样的类似的广告它只是你通报到它下架它才会下架其他的它是不管的那这个你完全没有法规可以管它那这个我觉得就是平台的责任那平台也一直跟你讲说你要我做任何事情那你就立法那我其实一直在看这个digital service act 我也非常希望可以成功 yes, you know why we tried also with voluntary, you know, self uh, restriction of the platforms, but it just didn't really work. Especially Elon Musk being the best example, because yeah. after he took uh, Twitter was actually quite good in that mm -hmm. before it belonged to Elon Musk. And as soon as Elon Musk bought Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, one of the first things he announced was that he's pulling back from this voluntary uh, agreement. So 
there has to be regulation. There has to be, and of course there has to be a debate about it, but it doesn't work without it. 嗯，其实你在文章里面其实提到了一个我也很喜欢的，引引用了那个严连科的文的句子。Yeah. 对，他是呃中国非常有名的作家。作家。对，对其实我他讲了一段，我念一下。他说：“我一直以为历史跟记忆最后会战胜扭曲，但看来是恰恰相反哦。现在是在今日的中国，失意战胜了记忆，谎言战胜了真相。恐惧之一是经历过的人都必谈往事，对于权力的默许在。”中国是基本的生存法则。当人们逐渐习惯了失意，怀疑那些质问的人，就会逐渐遗忘过去。但我看这句话的时候，我另外一个想法是，我自己越来越觉得，尤其是年轻时代，他们的生活其实不是活在真实的世界，所以他们都是活在数位的世界，时间很多，所以他其实没有体感的记忆。嗯，所以我一直觉得在。数位的这个地方的治理，其实是一个我觉得民主世民主世界最大的挑战，其实就是在 digital 这个世界里面，嗯、我们要怎么样建立一个一个呃，他们应该有的社会秩序，或者是大家 common 认同的一个价值。但是我觉得这一块在世界的讨论是非常少的，我不知道你的看法是。Yeah, it will be completely new lives, but how are we old people to、yeah. <laughs> to judge that? Maybe you know.、Um, I mean, because one, you have three children, children. I have three children, and it, I struggle all the time, you know, to get them away from their mobile phones. And I mean, the good thing is, they're not only living in the mobile phones, right? I mean,、mm-hmm. they still have the family life, they still have school、uh, life and education. I think, I mean, education is one of the most important things we have to pay attention to, and I think we've been too slow. In that, and there has to be media literacy. Yeah. So, because you do find good things, great things on the internet as well, right?、Mm-hmm. Why did Greta Thunberg in Sweden start the Fridays for Future uh, uh,、yeah. movement? You know, she was a, a, an autistic little girl having、mm-hmm. health problems, shying away from all people, spending all her time. On social media, but not with stupid TikTok stuff. She was researching climate change、yes. uh, and started a, a worldwide movement. So there is good opportunities、uh, there.、Um, we just have to, as I said, we have to educate people. We have to be, I don't know, loving to our children and also remind them of the other world、uh, out there. But I think, yeah, we we. The two of us, we might not know the future. It might look very, very different from what we imagine yes, it to be.、Right. But it might as well still be, and it can be, still a democratic future. Maybe、yes. a democratic future where a big part of their lives will be led online in virtual、uh, spaces. But that makes our responsibility and our obligation to reinvent democracy digitally even more. Important, you know, and not let countries like China set global standards, for example, on the on this, and let them export their systems, their standards, their laws,、mm-hmm. their technology, their actual technology to to the world. You know, we also have to step up there. Yeah, I think in the last time of unusual conversation, our dialogue partner is Li Feifei. That I think Li Feifei mentioned that time when AI was first developed. Actually, I think it was first developed. 因为它实在发展的速度快太快，然后取代人类的速度太快，所以我觉得它也是一个 wake up call。大家对 digital world 还有 technology 到底要怎么治理，我就开始全世界在想这件事情哦。所以我想，呃，《和谐社会》这个这本书其实，呃，也看到了它其实不是只有一个中国的议题。我其实觉得科技。对于全世界的民主制度，其实有很大的影响。那我们只是在中国看到一个很极端的例子，那每一个人都可以看到，在中国的这这本书里面看到了自己似曾相似的影子。我们今天谢谢马凯，跟我们分享了一个小时，整整一个小时的时间。<笑>谢谢马凯，谢谢你。<笑>好，然后我们后面有一点点 Q A 的时间。那其实有一个问题，我觉得还蛮好的。呃，我来，呃、我是不是？你好像要走了，走了对对。但是你 OK， 再一个问题好不好？好<笑><笑> ，OK， 呃，好，他的问题是说，感觉上从你的书里面看到，好像中国的东西完全势不可挡。
你觉得有没有什么东西可以打下中国的势力？ Uh, I think,、um, well, first of all, you know, there was a time when we thought we could change China. Yeah, right. I think that time is long gone.、Okay. We can't change China. China is changing us now.、Yes. You know, we thought, we thought capitalism would change、right. China. We thought the internet would change China. Now we 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 see China is changing capitalism. China is changing the internet. We can stop that. So we can stop China letting change us. And then at the same time, I think I、uh, mentioned it a little bit before. I think actually Xi Jinping is probably reaching a point where he is stopping the rise of China himself.、Mm -hmm. Okay, just by himself, just like you say. Uh, we actually most should be the biggest enemy is our own. Yeah, China is our own. Yes, I think so. <laughs> That doesn't mean the end of the Communist Party, right, by the way. Right, right. And it does not mean that it will be. May be destructive at the same time, but I don't think it will be like number one in the world. I don't think. Okay. Thank you, Ma Tai. Thank you.